In 1925, Pius XI instituted the Feast of Christ the King as an antidote to secularism, which is really the attempt to think and to live without reference to God. And it's something that already we began to see in 1925 and certainly something that we continually tend against, uh, uh, kind of contend against today. And so today on this feast, which has been renamed the Solemnity of Our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the Universe, the church is confidently declaring that Jesus Christ is the king of every person. He's the king of every family, the king of every society, every nation. He really is our king. And so before I talk about what this means for us, I want to kind of remind all of us about what this, what Je- what this means. First of all, what kind of king is Jesus? Unlike secular authority or political authority, he does not impose his rule on us because he's a king of love. Right? He reigns in love. While he is the creator of the universe and could very well demand us and enforce us to obey him, because he has that right, everything we have comes from him, he chooses to love us when we don't deserve it, and he invites us to love him in response. And therefore, as Christians, we recognize that it is precisely because he is the full revelation of God that he reigns in love. That's the first thing. The second thing to remember is that it is in the person of Jesus and in the ministry of the church that his reign, his kingdom, has come. We can say in a very confident way that his kingdom has broken into this world. But it's not fully here, is it? We live in this kind of middle reality between an already a reign, but a not yet. We know that it's not until we have the fullness of life in heaven that his reign is going to be complete. And therefore, in this life, there's a real drama, a real battle as to what kind of reign we're going to live under, our own reign or his. And therefore, there's always a battle between Love and sin, between falsehood and truth, between community and love and relationships and division and separation and destruction, between self-reliance and God-reliance. And so as we consider Jesus' kingship today, there's a particular line from St. Paul's uh, reading, our second reading, that really kind of jumped out at me. It's something that we need to remember about what God has done for us. Paul is talking about redemption. This is what he says. God delivered us from the power of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That he's delivered us from one kind of dominion. Another translation here for power of darkness is dominion of darkness. Right In this dominion, Satan is the ruler of this this dominion. He's the ruler of this world. God has transferred us from that power and brought us into the kingdom of his beloved son. And the distinction is pretty radical. When did Jesus transfer us from one dominion to the other? He did this for each of us in baptism. And so as Christians who live under the reign of Jesus, I want this morning to to simply offer five advantages of living under the kingship of Jesus. And I'm going to contrast that with how the power of darkness is playing itself out in our current culture. Number one advantage of living under the kingship of Jesus is the forgiveness of sins. Because of what our king has done for us on the cross, we can live in peace knowing that we have the full forgiveness of our sins, that he's washed us with his precious blood. And then if we sin, no matter how many times we sin, no matter how grievous that sin is, he has the desire and the power to wash us. And so we can live in this confidence that he can clean up our mess and take away our shame, and we can live in joy of knowing his forgiveness. But what happens when we don't live under his kingship? What begins to happen is that we begin to struggle with all sorts of evil with regard to the dominion of darkness. Very specifically, Satan accuses us of our sin. He condemns us. He judges us. And we feel condemned and we feel shame and we tend to turn inward out of this pain of our conscience when we don't live in the dominion of Jesus. We don't live in his kingdom. And when that is kind of writ large in society and people can't really heal their own hearts because they need forgiveness, what we begin to see is that people who deny God begin to try to explain sin away. Let's just explain sin away. Let's just, or maybe let's rationalize it and let's try to to kind of justify what we do. And that's what's happening in our culture, in our society. 
and in people who don't live under his reign. One of the things that's interesting, and I've said this before, is that because we're increasingly rejecting God as a society, if we reject the God of forgiveness, we shouldn't be surprised that there's very little forgiveness in public life today. What do you think the whole cancel culture comes from? That's where it comes from. There's no forgiveness if you make a mistake. You're canceled. And so you see a harshness come upon the world that only Jesus has the capacity to soften through his precious blood and through his forgiveness. So the first advantage of living under the kingship of Jesus is the forgiveness of sins. The second is freedom from fear and death. Our king has destroyed sin. He's destroyed death and he's disarmed the, 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 the devil. In fact, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And so as Christians, we can live in confidence that we no longer have to be afraid of death. We can live in confidence in the face of all sorts of trials and tragedies. Because he, as a king, is stronger. He is victorious. But if we don't know his reign in our life, if we're not submitting ourselves to him, then we're susceptible to a paralyzing fear of death. And I think we witnessed that during the pandemic, didn't we? Right? All of us, we had this virus that was unleashed in the world, and we were afraid this virus could kill us. And, and some of us really saw the power of fear in our own life. And as Christians, we don't have to live in such fear. Yes, we want to be careful, we want to be cautious, but there's a difference between being cautious than being paralyzed by fear. See, as Christians, we, when we know that Jesus is Lord and he's risen from the dead, we don't have to live in this fear. We also don't have to live in a paralyzing fear of being rejected by our, by our culture, or by our friends and our family, right? So sometimes when we don't know the reign of Jesus in our life and we kind of stick out and get ridiculed or mocked, we can live in a paralyzing fear that makes us not want to stick out. In fact, it, it, we, we become vulnerable then if we have a fear of, not, of sticking out to certain co- kinds of social bullying or certain kinds of manipulation that can happen by people who are in power, right? We can kind of give into that because we're desperately desired to be affirmed and wanted in such a way that we're controlled by those who have power over us. My brothers and sisters, Jesus, our King, will never seek to manipulate you. He will never seek to control you because he is a love who respects and honors your freedom in order to get you to love in return. Because with Jesus, we don't have to be afraid of death, nor do we have to be afraid of anything else. Number three, what Jesus does when we live into it, when we live in his kingdom, is that he frees us from the narrow confines of the self, or as what I like to put as the prison of our self-concern. Right? So he frees us from ourselves, and we, because of his grace, come alive to creation. We have the capacity to come alive to the goodness of the world and to come alive to other people in such a way that we can form satisfying and healthy relationships with people. Right? It's, it's really the grace that he gives to us to be free from sin, to be free for relationship. You know, when, when we don't have his kingdom, his kingship in our life, we're left to our selfish and evil desires, which we know destroys everything that we know we're made for. It destroys relationships, it destroys families, communities, and it destroys joy. God wants us to live in his kingship. He doesn't want us to fall into a a despair, which is really the result of the brokenness around us. He wants us to recognize that we're free to love when we submit to his reign. Number four, the fourth advantage of living under the kingship of Jesus is that because of what he's done, we know who we are that each of us have become beloved sons and daughters of God, redeemed sinners, you know, uh, temples of the Holy Spirit. And there's no one in your life and nothing in your life that can take that from you. We can live in the security of our identity because what happens when we don't know him as our king reigning in our life is we find ourselves desperately seeking to form an identity by what we do. By, by, by trying to be successful to kind of make a name for ourselves or maybe fitting into the, the right kind of group that we can kind of try to make ourselves of this identity that, that gives us meaning in our life. But those identities are actually relatively superficial and are always at risk of being lost. They're one delicate step away of being lost to throw us into a full-blown identity crisis. 
You see, as Christians, we have our identity rooted in Jesus, in eternity. He's given us an identity of him that nothing can destroy. And so as Christians, we recognize that this is perhaps one of the most powerful things that nothing can take away what God has done for you. And finally, the fifth advantage of living under the kingship of Jesus is that we can have meaning and purpose in life. One of the best things that God has done for us is that because he's opened up eternity for us, all of our actions and decisions are imbued with eternal meaning. Everything we do can echo for eternity. It's precisely in Jesus who makes us for himself. He calls us to communion. That's his plan. He wants us to be in communion with him, and he wants us to, be, uh, he wants us to love each other. He has a specific plan for each of our lives. And that plan is something that God gives to us, and it gives meaning to us, so that in our trials and our difficulties, we'll see from eternity that the worst sufferings in this life are just kind of, as St. Teresa of Avila said, can be seen just as a, as, a, as a night in an inconvenient hotel. That's how powerful eternal meaning is. But when we don't live under the kingship of Jesus and we reject God as king over our life, like much of our culture is attempting to do, what we see is this desperate anxious attempt to create alternate meta-narratives that perhaps are trying to infuse meaning onto reality. So rather than receiving meaning from God and from reality itself, being created and redeemed, we're seeing a whole set of people who reject God trying to infuse meaning by creating all these narratives to, to give meaning to their life. Most people know that such an attempt is futile because death destroys everything. Other people who know that it is such a, a fool's quest, they'll simply resolve, they'll have this kind of modern kind of boredom or desperation just trying to do everything they can to get what they can from this world, to be as successful as possible, to spend as much money as possible, to get as much pleasure as possible. That too is foolishness because that ends in death. You see, Jesus Christ gives us meaning. His love gives us meaning. His kingship gives us meaning. And so my brothers and sisters, we know that Jesus is our victorious king. We know that this truth changes everything. But it's not enough for us to declare this truth to the world. It's not even enough for us to believe it. The real question is, is how are we responding to the kingship of Jesus? You see, the truth is that if we think about it, the only sensible response to the revelation of God or Jesus as our king is to surrender everything is to allow him to reign in every single part of our life. And here's the rub, that we know as Christians he's never going to force himself upon us, which means all the advantages of living under his kingship are only ex accessed by those who choose to submit to his reign. I know that all of us in one way or another struggles with submitting to Jesus' reign, and I, I struggle myself. And we all struggle in different ways. There might be some people here who struggle in very basic ways, but serious ways. Maybe, maybe you're one that has a hard time praying every day. Maybe you're, you're barely here at Mass because you, you haven't yet kind of submitted to Jesus as, as king of at least one day of your week. But there might be other people struggling in other ways. You might be very strong in one area of your life. Yeah, I've submitted that part of my life to you, Lord. But this is other part of my life I'm having a hard time. Maybe for you that's your finances. Maybe for some of you, it's, it's your sexual life and your understanding of your sexuality and how you use it. Or maybe for some of you, it's, it's the, the way you see the world and your political worldview, as we so devastatingly saw in the approval of Proposal 3. Whatever your struggle is, I want to encourage you. You're not alone. If you desire to live in the benefits and the advantages of the kingship of Jesus and you struggle, be at peace that you're not alone. He's not expecting you to do it on your own. In fact, he gives his grace so as to help you and to stir you up to surrender to him. In fact, that's how good he is. He never asks you to do something without giving you the grace to do it. And so today, as we prepare to receive our King and Holy Communion, to enthrone him on our hearts once more, I want to lead all of us in a recommitment to submission to the King. And so if you're ready to resubmit your life to him, I want you to repeat a little prayer after me. And if you're not ready, that's okay as well. But I invite all of us to close our eyes uh, so we can just give our king his due honor. And if you're ready, I want you to repeat this little prayer after me. 
Thank you, Jesus, for being my king. Thank you for delivering me from the power of darkness and transferring me into your kingdom. I submit everything in my life to you. All that I have, all that I am, all that I long to be. And I give you permission to reign as my king. I beg you for the grace to follow you every day so that I can live in the forgiveness of sins. I can be free from fear and death. And knowing who I am, I can be free to love in the eternal purpose you have for me. I thank you, Lord, and I love you. Amen.